Welcome everyone to our NCAA Social Series. I'm Andy Katz. On this edition of our program, we're going to talk about the men's and women's basketball championships, all happening in March and early April. I'm pleased to be joined by Senior Vice President Dan Gavitt, in charge of basketball, Lynn Holtzman, Vice President in charge of women's basketball. Uh, a lot to unpack here. Uh, let's start with the women's tournament because there's a lot of new things to get excited about and the season's been tremendous so far. Record ratings, great action across the country. Let's start with the format. We've got, uh, when we get to the Elite Eight, two sites instead of four. Uh, what's the uh, sort of anticipation of what that could look like? Well, we're excited about a lot of new things this year, um, kind of following up the, a very successful championship last year. So the format difference that's being um, launched this year is for our regional rounds. So in years past, the regionals were four different sites, eight teams at each site, but now those, uh, the regionals are taking place at the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight at two sites. So this year, those sites are Greenville, South Carolina, and Seattle. Um, basically, what it delivers on is four straight days of competition, highly competitive women's basketball. And it really is an opportunity that within those communities that we can um, execute in some different ways around those games. Uh, what we've seen already is uh, really great ticket sales going to two sites. And that was one of the objectives, among other objectives, by the committee when they made the decision about four or five years ago. And two places that really love women's basketball in mm -hmm. South Carolina and Seattle obviously had great success with the WNBA. Uh, we're going to get to more, certainly, with the women's tournament. Dan, with the men's tournament, um, you know, Obviously, there's been great success, another great season, so much parity. What are you most looking forward to seeing in this March Madness? Madness. <laughs> it's just a lot of incredible games and drama. Uh, boy, just in you know, one of the most recent weekends, we had several buzzer beaters, unranked teams beating ranked teams on their home court. Um, you know, we're going to have one seeds and two seeds and three seeds, but boy, I don't think anyone's safe. It's going to be a great tournament. All right, so both championships in the state of Texas. Houston again, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, for the men and for the women, divisions one, two, and three in Dallas. It really will be a basketball festival. Mm -hmm. um, the planning for such an event like that, to have all three championships at one site in Dallas, how has that been going? It's been going great. I mean, as you know, this is the second time in women's basketball that we have this opportunity to have a joint Division One, Two, II, and Three championship, same location. And essentially, we're crowning three national champions. That provides um, the opportunity and access for fans to see the Division One semifinals on Friday, Division Two and Three championship games on Saturday, and the women's um, Division One championship game on on Sunday. All of those are being played in American Airlines Center. That is also a unique element around this event for women's basketball. Um, and then all the, all the ancillary and fan events that surround that. So it's gonna be a great time. It's gonna be what we anticipate, a tremendous student athlete experience. The, for our Division Two and Three student athletes, when it happened previously, it was here in Indianapolis, um, they cited that was one of the greatest experiences of their career. So we are really looking forward to, not just for the fans, but for the student athletes to experience this celebratory event. It's also the opportunity for us here at the NCAA through our women's championship and also our men's championship, uh, the final fours is to do the culminating celebratory event around the 50th anniversary of Title IX. So we are certainly um, strategically integrating that within this great celebration of women's basketball. The men have had a chance to do that and there was actually plans if I'm not mistaken, to, to maybe do it in 2020 in Atlanta. What's a great benefit of having all three divisions crown their championship at one event? It's a celebration of the game. You know, coaches love it because, you know, so many coaches start at a lower level and then make their way up to Division One if they're successful enough. And, you know, whether you're a Division Three men's women's basketball player or Division One, you're just as competitive, right? And you love the game as much as any of your other divisional uh, counterparts. So it's, it's really, as Lynn noted, a celebration of the game and a great thing for fans to, to engage with. Field of 68, both men and women, first four. Um, what's your read on, and obviously there's more of a, a you know, sort of data to, to digest on the men's side, but how that has been a success and what are you looking forward to on the women's side? Well, you know, 68 deserving teams will find their way there. We know 32 automatic qualifiers and 36 at-large teams. And, and both committees are going to have their hands full. But on the first out. four aspect, I'm saying. Oh, first that four in particular. We've sure. seen now some data, and obviously now 
uh, with the women. Well, we've had, what, now two teams advance from first four on the men's side to the final four. Um, you know, so we have really competitive games there, a chance for uh, teams to get two or more games in the tournament, have one under their belt before they play a first-round game. And, you know, on the men's side, we've been so blessed to have Dayton host that event for now a number of years. It's going to be sold out again this year. Tremendous experience for student athletes, great atmosphere to tip off the tournament. And on the women's side? Well, this is the second year with the expansion of going to 68 teams last year. That last year was our first time that we launched and um, the first four games. The format is a little bit different because on the women's side, the first four games and the first and second round games are at campus hosted sites. Um, that has been the case. And in fact, the committee took time to review that this past summer and made the decision that strategically where we are with the continued growth of the championship and our objectives around that, that their plans right now are to gather data information and metrics. And uh, then as we look forward toward ladder championships, they're intentionally going to review all that, look at where we are with the growth of the championship, and then make decisions if this type of hosting format continues, or if we move similar to the men to a neutrally located uh, site for the first four and those first and second rounds. I know you don't have any final says on this, but obviously that is a topic of expansion. Um, you know, especially on the women's side, you know, how much do you want to see sort of how 68 plays out before there is any discussion of should it be 72, 96, and so on? Because you got to sort of see some data over the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to note just around the bracket expansion conversations that are a result of the Transformation Committee report um, for all of our championships. You know, the sport committee is encouraged to explore that, is that... Um, for men's and women's basketball, there is the individual men's and women's examination, but there also has to be consideration given a lot of the gender equity review that we've taken everything around participation opportunities to make sure there's a collaborative effort by our committees as they review this topic. Ultimately, it is going to be our membership's decision on what happens around any um, decisions with bracket expansion. Um, it is important to note, though, um, one of the items that was also a recommendation and is coming to fruition out of the first gender equity report is that in 2024, there's going to be a new women's uh, postseason event that is essentially modeled off of the NIT on the men's side, 32 teams. So that increases the NCAA supported postseason opportunities um, to 100 for both men's and women's basketball. You know, and to that point, I think sometimes people forget about the other postseason that has been going on on the men's side. So it's not like there aren't other opportunities, and now they will be there for the women as well before we get into all the expansion of actually playing in the postseason. True. We're in well over 25%, which is what the recommendation was from the Transformation Committee. So the committees will do their due diligence, obviously, on the recommendation from TC, uh, but that'll happen over the summertime. Well, and I also think that people forget that those other sports don't have you know, these other tournaments, you know what yeah. I mean? You know, that, that men's and women's basketball uh, has had and will have. Um, exposure, uh, the fact that the championship game will be uh, over the air, non-cable, if you will, on ABC. Uh, but even this season, just what's your reaction to how well women's basketball has been received with greater exposure in high profile windows this past season? Yeah, it's been it's been very well received, you know, and you could you can take the attitude or the approach, you know, it's been earned also because of the performance of the teams and where fans are expecting and demanding to have access through broadcasts and other means to those games. And the broadcast networks and partners and others have responded to that. Um, so that just it perpetuates itself positively in that growth cycle, which is really exciting. And to be able to have um, just access as a fan. Um, as we look forward to the championship, as you said, this is the first time um, ESPN has been our broadcast partner with the Women's Basketball Championship for many, many years. And we saw um, three years ago, we started seeing where ESPN, as they work with ABC, that we had started having some of those earlier round games um, being available on ABC where there may have been some open windows. And that continu has continued also with their collaboration and partnership to expand itself 
and the championship game. It was announced that it's going to be, as you said, uh, for the first time on ABC here. Um, that is a tremendous, um, again, access opportunity for our fans because it is a, a basically a free-to-air network. So we're excited to see what the data is around that. We had record-setting years last year. We had record-setting years, record-setting broadcast viewership the year before as well. And we anticipate this year it's going to be um, blown out of the water as well. Um, the other important thing is that um, it's not just broadcast. We've seen with the regular season and our last several championship also increase attendance numbers. So we're getting the double positive hit through this, which is attendance at games and also the viewership. Obviously, there's going to be tremendous talent on the floor. We've got returning players of the year, Leah Boston from South Carolina, Oscar Shibwe from Kentucky. Uh, we could have new players of the year. Um, the selection process that both committees are going to have to go through here shortly, it's not going to be easy. And, and, and we're going to see you know, where there could be some brand names that maybe have a lower seed uh, based on the way they performed and uh, but may not be seeded to their talent, but their body of work. How often do you both have to consistently educate that to the public, even to the membership, that you're still going to be seeded to what you did, not necessarily what the name is on the front of the, on the, front of the jersey? I think that's one of the reasons why the why fans love these championships so much. It's what you did this year, right? This, the evaluation of these teams starts on November 9th or wherever the first day of the season is. And it doesn't matter what the preseason rankings were or what you did last year. It matters what happens this season. And because of that, you're going to see, you're right, some you know, tr traditional blue bloods that may be lower seeded or not make the field at all. And then some teams that had tremendous seasons that may be less household names that will be very highly seeded. And so um, we, we feel really good about the process um, for the committees. They work incredibly hard. Um, it is uh, done with the utmost of uh, ethics, and, and um, we're excited about the start of selection week here and seeing how those brackets play out. Yeah, I, I mean, same thing. You know, it's. Um, I think if, you know it's also not just the marquee names, and we have in our case, you know, you have some of those mainstays when you look at the committees, well, the two top 16 reveals this year. But I think one of the exciting things on the women's side, and as Dan noted, is that you also have programs that continue to elevate themselves up. We have IU that was um, the last top 16 revealed, showed them as an as the second number one seed. You have um, success with the University of Utah. Those are just names that we haven't historically seen, but that speaks to the growth and the pair of the game um, that continues to um, ex um, grow, if you will, for women's basketball. One last thing, Dan. Um, we, I mentioned this at the beginning about Houston. Uh, there was a big gap before Houston was sort of playing national games. Uh, and then in the 2000s, you know, 11, 14, if I've got that correctly, and, and, and uh, you know, there's been a whole string of them here. Uh, what is it about the city of Houston that the NCAA has continued to go back to here more recently with Final Fours? 16, I think, is the Chris Jenkins. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, thank you. It's pretty memorable yes. in, in Houston. Yeah, the third Final Four for the men in Houston just the last 12 years. Uh, the city has continued to do a really, really good job, like Dallas, mm -hmm. in, in organizing, um, getting better each time we've been to Houston. The downtown area has more hotels. The footprint is very tight. Of course, Energy Stadium is, is 20 minutes outside of downtown, but otherwise all the teams will stay downtown. Um, there, all the uh, concert series and, and fan fest will take place in, within walking distance of the team hotels. Oh, and by the way, we'll also have the World Series champion Houston Astros with a four game homestand that weekend and the Rockets play two home games as well. So it'll be a bit of a circus, but in a, in a great way, uh, so much activity for fans to enjoy. And we've got, a really unique situation this year in Houston. We have for the very first time four host institutions. Houston Christian, Texas Southern, Rice, and the University of Houston will be our host institutions. We've never had more than two, I think, uh, host institutions before. For people, what does that mean to be a host institution? It means that they help us organize and plan for these events all year round. Um, it takes an awful lot of human capital to make that happen. Uh, local connections uh, through businesses and game operations and facilities. Um, so having you know, incredible host conference and institutions uh, to help us pull this off. Uh, and Big 12, of course, in Dallas is, helps us host uh, multiple rounds of the championships every year and is a va very valued host uh, in Dallas for us as well.
I'd be remiss if, if I didn't get out of here without mentioning the chairs. Lise Peterson from the Pac-12, Chris Reynolds, uh, AD at Bradley, just uh, their leadership, uh, what can you say about in both instances? You, know, you go first and then Dan. Um, I think what we have with our chairs is we have seasoned veterans and individuals, first and foremost, um, up, utmost integrity, making sure they, they take the responsibility of being a chair of managing the committee, uh, making sure that we adhere to the policy procedures and then how they represent the committee uh, very seriously and, very, and they're very professional about that. Um, and then what they bring to the table is just a multitude of years of experience. Um, and in the case of Lisa, Lisa Peterson, who's currently at the Pac-12, she was at University of Oregon for numerous years, worked with the women's basketball program there, as well as a variety of other sports. So um, to have that type of uh, experience, leadership experience, just benefits the committee. Same, you know, we're, we're blessed with great chairs that are either in their fifth or fourth year of service on the committee. So they've got a lot of experience. Uh, Lisa and Chris are tremendous. Uh, Chris is unique in terms of chairs, I think, in that he played in the Final Four in 1992. He was a starting point guard on the Indiana Hoosiers team, coached by Bob Knight, and so uh, that's kind of a neat story, too, that a former great student athlete who played in the Final Four is now overseeing uh, that this year. And we'll see if his alma mater can get there. Indeed. <laughs> they certainly will have a chance. Dan uh, and Lynn appreciate it, and we cannot wait for March Madness on the men's and the women's side. And as always, you go to ncaa.org slash social series where all our social series are archived. You can check out great conversations like this one.